I'm Rob Holliday from UNC Chapel Hill News Services, and I'm joined now by Dr. David Richardson, a professor in the Department of Epidemiology here at UNC Chapel Hill. Dr. Richardson, thanks so much for joining us. Sure, my pleasure. Certainly the crisis in Japan has been dominating the headlines uh, for a week now and will probably continue to do so. Um, what aspects of this situation that's constantly unfolding are you following the closest? Um, the issues related to the uh, nuclear accidents, um, the multiple reactors, and of particular concern to me has been the spent fuel ponds um, and what's happening there. What are some of the aspects of your background and your research that you find yourself drawing on as you answer questions about this, as you study this, as you follow it? I've spent um, a long time studying nuclear workers, so people who worked either manufacturing nuclear weapons or worked in nuclear power plants. Um, and I've also spent some time in Japan um, working on studies of the survivors of uh, the atomic bombings in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Um, so uh, that's kind of that's shaped my thinking, and a lot of my thinking has been about the workers um, who are doing basically firefighting now, trying to put out uh, um, fires that have emerged in the in the uh, cooling ponds, and then also problems in the with cooling in the reactors. The workers certainly are heroes in, in many regards for staying on scene and mm -hmm. continuing to, to fight that disaster. We keep hearing, as you would expect, a lot about Three Mile Island in 1979, the disaster there, and uh, Chernobyl from 1986. This yeah. one's still evolving, of course, but when all is said and done, how do you think this one is going to compare to those other two? Yeah, it's a complicated question. Um, uh, as other people pointed out, it's it's different and, and I think clearly more serious than what happened at Three Mile Island, um, if only because it's involving multiple reactors now. Um, there's, um, and it's involving fires in the spent fuel ponds. Um, that there's large amounts of fuel stored and while there'd been a lot of discussion and focus on, on the containments around the reactors and where they're gonna hold or where they're gonna be breaches or leaks out of the containments of the reactors, the fuel ponds themselves are, have very little containment and um, now we've lost, um, there's been damage or actually blowing off the small thin metal containment that there was around these fuel ponds. So um, it leads to the possibility that there's um, a loss of a lot of nuclear material that's stored in the fuel ponds, but it's not the same material as um, in Chernobyl. Um, so this is what's different. Chernobyl had a graphite, re graphite reactor, which the graphite actually caught on fire and burned. Uh, there wasn't a containment structure, and that allowed a lot of the radioactive material to move high up into the atmosphere and travel for long distances. So even um, though we're now facing multiple reactors, breaches in the containment, and fuel ponds that are burning, um, it's, it's not necessarily going to um, move the same way that the Chernobyl um, uh, accident moved in terms of environmental contamination over large distances. That would be my expectation still is that uh, we're not going to see kind of global movement of fallout. Um, I think it's going to be a more local, uh, local problem, but it's going to have a s substantial impact on Japan. Because people think about, you know, nuclear fuel as nuclear fuel, and they don't think of the differences between plutonium versus uh, the, the graphite design that you talked about. Right. I and mean, that's a pretty substantial difference, isn't it? Right. I mean, the, well, the, yeah, the difference in, in, in how that an operating reactor caught on fire and the graphite that was uh, part of the core actually caught and burned, that was very different. What's, um, yeah, in, in this case, a number of the, rea the reactors went into partial or complete shutdown. They weren't running, um, but there was a lot of energy left. And there's actually even energy when they've removed the fuel and placed it into these cooling ponds. The, they're physically hot, uh, radioactively hot, but also physically hot. And that's the problem that they were facing. They lost the ability to keep them cool. And so the fuel has started to melt and bubble um, and actually burst the cladding so that we're seeing venting of, of gases out of the fuel rods. The research that you've done, how could that be, certainly this uh, disaster is still unfolding, but the next time that something like this happens, hopefully it never will, but if it does, what are some ways that your research might be able to help limit the loss of life or prevent it altogether? Um, well, what I think is going to happen with this uh, accident is um, eventually it will resolve. Um, and then we'll have to understand um, how much radioactive material was lost and where it went. Um, 
So there has to be an inventory of, of what's left at the reactor and what was lost and a kind of environmental reconstruction of wh what, uh, where is the contamination gone. The research that I've done um, uh, focuses on the health effects of radiation exposures and how people change in their vulnerability to radiation-induced cancer as they age. Um, and also, when do the cancers appear and how long does that excess persist? So those are all going to be sorts of questions about what are the risks from the environmental contamination. So um, a lot of your real intense work will be after the fact. Um, yeah, I, it's, I think that's the case. So many different storylines here. I mean, it's a, a disaster that's hard to even fathom. Uh, even several days later, you have an earthquake that triggers a tsunami, and now there's this nuclear crisis. Certainly a lot of different aspects of this that are being reported on. What are some things that maybe the public hasn't heard about yet that they should be paying attention to? Well, the, the first one is this, the issue of the fuel ponds. Um, and it actually has um, implications for us here at home as well. Um, we have a lot of waste that's stool, or stored right now in, in pools or cooling ponds um, the same way. And it's been an issue that's been raised um, going back, for example, to 2006. The uh, National Academy of Sciences issued a report where they talked about the vulnerability of these pools. And particularly for this type of boiling water reactor where the, the pools are stored at an elevated height um, with a thin metal shielding around them. Um, and the concern at the time, which I think is still a valid concern that was raised by um, uh, the members of that National Academies panel, was the vulnerability of these pools to terrorist attack, for example, yeah. which um, uh, following September 11th became an issue that the government began to pay more focused attention to. And the recommendation was to begin to move these rods when they've cooled sufficiently into dry cast storage and, and um, separate them out and perhaps put earthen berms around them so that there's not a clear line of sight, but also they just become air-cooled then. You don't need to continually pump water. So we have, it's, I think that's going to certainly again be an issue that's raised here when we start thinking about um, what are the lessons learned from this accident. One of them is don't store large amounts of radioactive material in pools where we have to keep them cooled. Um, and so there's better alternatives and I think we're going to, um, I hope, we'll learn from this. No question about that. Well, Dr. David Richardson of the Department of Epidemiology here at UNC Chapel Hill, thanks very much for your time. Thank really you. Really appreciate your insights. Sure.